I had to go over 16 different diseases for abdominal pain and you guys suddenly drop a bomb on me saying you want syncope? Fine, we'll do syncope. Now before we start this video, one of my followers reached out to me and told me that I need to put more text into my video. Okay, you lazy little shit. Here's what I'm gonna do for you guys. I'm gonna put on the lazy board. So everything I say is gonna be on this text whiteboard, the lazy board, the, the lazy board, yes. It's gonna be the lazy board because you guys are lazy. As we go through this video, I'm going to be explaining a lot of diagnosis and there are going to be some critical ones, some emergent ones, and some non-emergent ones. As an emergency doctor, we are trained to think of the worst differentials first. All I have are negative thoughts. Another thing I want to mention is syncope and presyncope is going to be interchangeable because the differentials are the same, the mortality is the same, and approach is the same. So let's break up our differentials into categories. We're going to think about the brain, the heart, the lungs, neurally mediated, orthostatic mediated, and some medications that we're going to get into detail. Let's pick up the brain first. So there's two categories that I want you to subdivide in it. There's normal perfusion and there's hypoperfusion. So when you think of hypoperfusion, the things that you want to think about are subclavian steel syndrome, cerebrovascular diseases, subarachnoid hemorrhage, and a basilar artery migraine. Okay, and then there's also going to be cerebral syncope as well. When it comes to normal perfusion in the brain, there are differentials such as hypovolemia, hypoglycemia, seizures, and toxin mediated. Toxins are basically going to be medications. Now there is another subset of diseases which is going to be paired under psychiatric disorders, anxiety disorders, panic disorders, conversion disorders, breath holding spells. Now let's talk about the second system, the cardiac system. Now there's three sub branches in the cardiac system. Number one is outflow obstruction. And I want, you think, I want you to think about all the diseases that cause an obstruction to the blood flowing out of the heart. Now there's aortic stenosis, mitral stenosis, pulmonary stenosis. There can also be hypertroph hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, an atrial myxoma, or even cardiac tamponade. All of these things have one thing in common, and that is the fact that they obstruct the outflow of the heart. Now the second heading is reduced cardiac output, okay? So there's either a tachycardia going on or there is a bradycardia going on. So there's some kind of dysrhythmia which you're gonna pick up on the ECG. The brady bradycardias are gonna be six sinus syndrome, any degree of AV blocks, uh, Brugada syndrome, maybe QT prolongation. We're gonna talk about all those. And then on the other hand, with the arrhythmia, with the tachydysrhythmias, we have VTAC, VFib, uh, wolf parkinson white syndrome, torsade de point. My French is awful. In the cardiac system, there is a third subcategory which is not going to be related to outflow obstruction or a decrease in cardiac output. These conditions are two in number, namely myocardial infarction and aortic dissection. Now the next heading is neurally mediated. Uh, this can happen because of a lot of causes. It could be pain syncope, emotional syncope, valsalva syncope, post micturation syncope, cuff syncope. So in the history section, we're going to talk about what exactly the patient was doing at the time of syncope in order to make a better diagnosis. The next section is relatively easy. It's orthostasis mediated. In this section, you only have to remember a couple of things, which is dehydration, anemia due to acute blood loss or chronic blood loss, and an important cause is a GI bleed. So let's talk about medications. What medications is always the question some people ask me, and there is an easy mnemonic to remember this, A, B, C, D, E. Okay, so A is going to be primarily for antiarrhythmics, anticonvulsants, antiepileptics. B is going to be for beta blockers. C is going to be for centrally acting antihypertensives. D is going to be for diuretics and digoxin. And then let's, uh, let's just forget E. And what we're going to do is we're going to think of three other drugs that are very important in causing syncope. Number one, vasodilators. Number two, QT prolongation drugs. And number three is insulin. Insulin is extremely important because we talked about hypoglycemia earlier in the video. Now that we've got all the diagnosis out of the way, let's dive into the history and see how we're gonna make a difference between all of these things because there's a lot to be honest with you. So if you ask a patient whether his uh, syncope was abrupt or whether it happened while sitting down or supine or whether it happened within the span of a few seconds, these things usually point towards a serious cause. When you ask a patient about whether the syncope occurred during exertion, it can uh, point towards a condition which has outflow obstruction, mainly 
Uh, you must have heard about the fact that hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy occurs in athletes in young people when they are exerting themselves a lot. If the patient suffers from a SYNCB after exertion, it is usually orthostasis mediated. It could be a GI bleed, it could be an internal hemorrhage going on somewhere. Keep in mind, if the patient has palpitations along with it, think of a dysrhythmia. If the patient has dyspnea along with it, think of a lung condition, maybe pulmonary embolism. When it comes to pulmonary embolism, only 0.2% of patients with pulmonary embolism are going to present with syncope. If the patient has any chest pain with it, think of an infarct, think of aortic dissection, think of pulmonary embolism. If the patient has had a seizure, he's going to have multiple injuries on all of his body and he's definitely going to have a tongue bite because tongue bite has a sensitivity which is very high for uh, seizures. Um, a lot of people are going to have trouble differentiating between a seizure and a syncope on history and we're going to get to that. There are separate scores for that. Uh, we will discuss that in a little bit. Earlier in the video, we discussed about what exactly the patient was doing when the syncope occurred because that is going to point us towards our diagnosis. Now, in older patients, the baroreceptors and the carotid bodies are extremely sensitive. So, let's say, for example, the patient goes to the bathroom. He's either micturating, he's coughing, he's gurgling water, or he's brushing his teeth. Those things can actually cause syncope. So, in the history, make sure that you ask what the patient was doing specifically inside the bathroom if he can remember it. At the end of each history, risk factors are extremely important. Diabetes, hypertensive, smoking, any other drugs, whether the patient has any hearing aids placed because it's very important and has a relationship with Lown Gannon Levine syndrome. And then you have to ask about uh, family history, a history of cerebrovascular disease because they're gonna uh, help you in pointing you towards your diagnosis. Now after history, you have to perform a thorough examination on every system because we're dealing with a lot of systems here a neurological examination a cardiac examination a lung examination even an abdominal examination for any pulsatile abdominal mass but uh, if you do look for a pulsatile abdominal mass you're going to only find them when the aneurysm is around more than five centimeters dilated um, coming to a cardiac examination you're going to want to see the pulse brady or tacky you're going to want to see pulse inequalities in limbs. You're going to see a uh, on a precordial examination, muffled heart sounds, distended neck veins, or maybe a irregular beats. Um, I hate talking about examination. What? I'm not going to tell you everything. They're ju they're just right there. Just read them. Now I hear you say, Saad, anyone can tell us these things, but what are we actually looking for when we match the symptoms with the, diagnos with the diagnosis, with the lab investigations, and with the examination? What, how do we fit the puzzle? Okay, so let's go over a couple of things that are going to help you in making the diagnosis. Let's look at the ECG first, okay? So I want you to remember a mnemonic, which is going to be W-O-B-B-L-E-R, wobbler. Now, how this mnemonic works is W is for Wolf Parkinson White syndrome or Lown Ganong Levine syndrome, both of which are pre excitation syndromes. O is for an obstructed AV node. B is for bifascicular block. The other B is for a Brugada syndrome. And L is for left ventricular hypertrophy or a hokum. E is for an epsilon wave, which is going to be specific to arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. <sighs> Who came up with these names? R is for, oh god, that ARVC just shattered everything in my mind. Repolarization abnormality. F ARVC. Now there is another score which I've talked about in one of my previous posts on my page which is called the Rose Syncope Roll and the mnemonic for that is BRACES, B-R-A-C-E-S. B is for bradycardia, B is also for BNP above 300, R is for rectal examination, a is for anemia, C is for chest pain associated with syncope, E is for ECG carrying Q waves but not in lead 3, and S is for an oxygen saturation of less than 94%. If one of them is positive, the patient fit fits, fulfills the criteria for admission. Now a lot of people are going to have trouble differentiating between a syncope and a seizure. There is a significant amount of overlap between the symptoms of the two. But in 2002, the American College of Cardiology published a paper by Robert Sheldon, which showed a score 
uh, based on nine questions which was used to differentiate between the two uh, I would suggest you Google that score because I'm not going to discuss it over here and see what those nine questions are and what the results give you any number of scores are available for syncope the San Francisco syncope rule the Canadian syncope rule the excess but um, since the row syncope rule is easier to use that's what I use personally but um, you know you need to have the San Francisco syncope rule inside your phone because that is the uh, like the widely validated score and it's pretty easy as well the mnemonic for that is C-H-E-S-S -S. it's time for some clinical pearls number one an atrial arrhythmia is less likely to produce syncope as compared to a ventricular arrhythmia number two 2.6% of children who have syncope are going to have a cardiac origin. Number three, a, a murmur, an outflow murmur, which increases on Valsalva maneuver is hokum until proven otherwise. And in patients with all the rigorous testing done, with every kind of test imaginable done, you're still not going to find a pathology in 80% of the patients, which means that this video is useless. time for the diagnostic algorithm the first thing you want to do is an ECG because you want to rule out dysrhythmias and an ischemic heart disease the second thing in line is orthostatic findings get a standing blood pressure a lying blood pressure if you think that there is significant difference between the two you could be looking at conditions that cause dehydration or anemia our prime suspect over here is GI bleed the next thing in line is doing a metabolic profile because we don't want to miss conditions like hyperglycemia hypoglycemia and adrenal insufficiency because you can find that on the electrolytes. The next thing in line is doing a neurological examination to look for any focal neurological deficit because if you do find one you are looking at cerebrovascular disease and you need to do a CT head or an MR to rule that out. The next thing is getting an echo done because you want to rule out things that cause outflow obstruction. Now remember, these will contain valvular heart diseases, pulmonary embolism, and also hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. Now the last thing you want to do is, I mentioned some studies in the ancillary uh, studies that we uh, did a couple of uh, minutes ago, and uh, one of those studies was beta HCG, uh, because you don't want to miss out the fact that pregnancy is causing the syncope. And then cardiac tamponade, you have to rule that out as well, because that decreases the venous return, and in turn it's going to cause a decrease in the cardiac output. That's the diagnostic algorithm. Thank you so much for watching. That is all I have about syncope. And if you think that I missed something, don't hesitate to put that down in the comment section. Uh, give me some feedback in the DMs. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Have a good day.